Okay, well, good afternoon from the um, city of Bristol uh, in the UK and the very first panel session of SMART 21. And this panel session is on human-centric autonomous networking for 6G, putting the human at the center of a machine-driven and machine-designed network. I'm Mark Beach. I'm a professor in radio systems engineering at the University of Bristol, and I will be chairing um, this, this panel. And I was thinking this morning, you know, it's absolutely amazing. Back in the 1980s, you know, this is the type of technology we had. This is a transportable um, Motorola phone. I don't know if my video is working very well. Um, and this is what we used to use to um, make calls using the analog tax network. And technology has really evolved at a tremendous pace over the last 40 years for something that really does weigh like a brick, has a very short talk time away from the car. And here we are today with miniaturized IoT sensor wireless networks with five years battery life. And we're considering the exciting application of machine learning and AI um, in the design and real-time optimization of future communications networks as we innovate through our pathway to 6G. I'm very fortunate today to be joined by four panelists who are working in the, in the area, both from industry, so from Interdigital and Samson, and also from academia, our own smart internet um, lab. So we can just move to the next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to have um, a set of questions um, for our panelists. And before I introduce them, um, I will say for the for the audience, if you wish to either put a question or a comment in, if you can do that via the, the Q&A box. But for, for us to be able to take that on and also complete your registration for the conference, can you check that your name in Zoom is correct, um, and you can see that. If it's not, using the chat function, um, the, the team behind us will actually correct online your, your name. Um, that saves you dropping out and rejoining, which um, is probably not the best thing to do. Anyway, if I can now move on and start introducing the panel. So next slide, please. So our, our first speaker is... Uh, Mona um, Jasimian from Interdigital, where she is a senior research and innovation manager. So Mona, what are your thoughts on putting the human at the center of the machine-driven and machine design network? Right, Mark. Um, when I had the title of the panel, uh, I realized how the vision that we are working on as part of the Next Generation Research Lab maps to the title that uh, a colleagues at University of Bristol has suggested. So I appreciate the invitation and uh, happy to be part of this panel discussion. Um, so we are we examining and uh, looking to uh, the next generation network in line with the human-centric approach with a couple of activities that we are running in our uh, group. I think I have a single slide that might actually support some of the discussion I wanted to share. If Anita can actually move to the next slide, please. Uh, and this is basically where we have started our uh, discussion on the first generation onward to the now sixth generation that we are working at. Uh, and uh, as part of the next generation networking, which will be the, uh, whichever number of the genes that we are working on, we are approaching closer and closer to human-centric uh, communication, starting from voice as the single mode of information now to the sixth generation, which is more of uh, different senses and attributes that needs to be carried and interacted, including the haptic communication, emotional communication, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is a nutshell if you want to, to then later we can discuss further on the slide uh, as well with more detail. Thank you very much. Can we just, yeah, we missed the, sorry, that was your, your slide. Yeah, sure, so I can slide. continue, yeah. right. right. Can um, you just do the animation on that, that slide? Hmm. 
Absolutely. So with the beyond uh, 5G generation, as you um, as it's uh, presented in the, the generation of the solar network here, we are looking at the three pillars, uh, uh, MMTC, massive machine type communication capability, URLC, uh, and uh, EMBB, the broadband communication. So as the generation evolves, we get to have more capabilities on the network side. And our vision in interdigital is for next generation of the uh, communication technology, if you call it 6G, would be more human centric, meaning we have the multi modality, multi sensory information also engaged to interact between the users, including uh, the wireless brain computer interaction that is also been in the research context as well as some demonstration that we have been. Uh, uh, seen in different conferences and activities, both in industry and academia. Uh, so if you categorize beyond 5G with the aspect of tactile information and tactile interaction, which require the URLC, the next generation that require to include human emotion and brain uh, communication would involve further computation and intelligence involved from the network. So categorizing the uh, different aspects of, the, of uh, the research that we are doing. The first slide, um, the enough evolution, should demonstrate the need for the network uh, core and the technology to evolve according to the need of the human-centric uh, communication, including the uh, cloud native uh, network function distribution, edge computing, not public network, all intelligence, including slicing that we already have in uh, current uh, technology, but also advance those to address the uh, so-called six senses in this, which includes the five senses that human um, uh, senses include, plus the sense of emotion interaction to facilitate and understand the user uh, experience and requirements. So that will lead us to this multimodal communication, which includes and delivered through different devices, XR, holographic, haptic uh, wearables. Um, and we have uh, some of these traditional devices that we are using, uh, mobile terminals, but they are further miniaturized to implantable and wearables to collect these biosens bi biometrics that we capture the human um, feel uh, and uh, information to relay for either interaction or communication as well as control. Uh, and um, looking at it as a part of a single terminal or distributed terminal. So currently we are mostly using our, our single terminal for our, our communication, but it's very soon that we have a different gadgets that pair with these terminal either for voice, for video, or for sense of touch, or also recording our emotion. And that's a kind of a distribution of the terminals that we think we require to have coordination requirement synchronization to be able to deliver to the immersive communication to the users. Uh, and this is a, a sort of activities that are happening in different standards shown by the including 3GP uh, presently. So multimodal human uh, interaction communication requires the user profile, including the user capability, as well as availability of the terminals uh, on the user perspective to deliver the, the high quality of experience, as well as helping the service providers to automate their network operation and increase their efficiency. Uh, with all these in line, we have introduced, we are introduced to new challenges, including the human psychological acceptance to these services, uh, lifestyle and social uh, societal changes that will influence throughout delivering these services. So uh, even if we define all these KPIs, there are more factors and dynamics uh, in, in the, in the, uh, in the scope to be addressed uh, and the challenges beside the already known challenges that we all have in telecommunication board, including data privacy, if it's a personal data, uh, to make sure it's synchronized, delivered uh, according to the uh, agreements and also addressing the reliability and security of the transport uh, of the information. So um, more advancement, yet more topics to be addressed accordingly. Okay.
Thank you very much. So our second panelist um, this, this lunchtime is um, the director of the Smart Internet Lab and also our conference chair. So over to you, Demetra. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. I think we can go directly to the, the next slide. So this morning I gave a, a talk around uh, human centricity, specifically focusing on future mobile networks and 60 and how we can drive it. I try to summarize some of our thinking in this slide, and that goes aligns very well with your thinking, Mona. So that, that, that was good, good to hear, and you preempted quite a lot of what I, I, uh, I would have actually planning to talk about. So we have been in a journey, and the journey is that we started our networks be, being very much infrastructure-centric, moving very much with 4G and 5G into device-centric. That means that actually, uh, the users of the network, uh, they, they are actually direct with the network only with the devices. And now we are coming, start thinking about human-centric architectures. So in my opinion, what drives this need and also is an enabler of human centricity is really that projection that we are going to have an awful lot of devices connected into our network. And that is not only sensors, it's cameras, it's mobile phones, it's holographic devices, it's AR, VR. So actually our network is going to host, it's already hosting, but it's going to increasingly host an awful lot of diverse devices to interact with. And I've got that number there, which I'm sure that you have seen that by 2030, we are going to have 59 more devices connected than the, the world population. Now this is a lot of devices. And this is actually both, if you like a concern, but also an enabler of how we are thinking of delivering services in the future. So the main question is that if actually devices are the main users of the network, what will be the role of humans in that de service delivery chain? And this is very important because if, for instance, network operators start designing services for machine-to-machine -machine communication, how we can deliver, you know, how we can change, actually make a step change in the services experienced by humans. And uh, Mona, you talked about Internet of Senses. And of course, with new devices, with uh, that capability of connected devices, we can actually start uh, delivering more than, uh, uh, you know, more than uh, video, more than sound, and we can start delivering all this other sensory information, like, for instance, smell, touch, hot or cold, and other sensory information. And this is something that new generation of networks are going to enable, uh, but they're going to enable in terms of the KPIs, you know, that the new technology is going to, to allow. For me, the important thing, again, even if you have a sen an internet of senses, that doesn't mean that you are human-centric. And go back to actually intelligence, because intelligence seems to be that is going to be delivering or be in the center of delivering quite a lot of these services, future network services. And we are doing a lot of work about intelligence associating with infrastructure. We are doing a lot of work intelligence associated with machines or intelligence associated with service delivery. When we are thinking about intelligence embedded in our network, where the human intelligence is sitting. So within our team, we are creating this concept of collective intelligence. That means that you take the digital intelligence embedded in infrastructures, machine and services, and actually match this with human intelligence in the form inferring human intent for network services. Now, this is quite complex. It's not easy to, to actually uh, deliver, but we've got an opportunity because with prevalence of machines, 
we have a lot of sensory information and behavioral information from humans to start thinking from this information, how we can infer human intent for a network service and then provide it customized. And actually at the same time, you know, look it against social KPIs rather than only technical KPIs. Now, when I say this is not easy to do, it's not easy because actually it requires a cross-disciplinary approach to the problem. It's not only a technical solution. We need information from behavioral sciences. We need socio-technical principles to understand them. We need social practices in the interpretation, in the articulation of the human intent. So it is a complex problem, but that is going in my opinion, to deliver that ultimate human centricity by addressing responsible innovation, sustainability, inclusion, privacy, trust in the service delivery, uh, you know, in the design of a service delivery. So for this, we need a co-creational, co-creation approaches and methodologies of future connectivity and services with the end users. Here at Bristol, we have established the Bristol Digital Futures Institute which is a cross-disciplinary institute uh, that is going to drive digital innovation, is going to drive user networks design through that co-creation with the users. We're putting together a digital twin for that, and also through developing methodologies for innovation with other disciplines, behavioral science, neuroscience, social sciences, and so on. And I will stop here. Mark, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> I was muted. There was a lot of noise out on the road. Right. OK, so let's go now back to industry and get a view from Dan Warren. Um, he's from Samson R&D in the UK, where Dan is the director of advanced network research. So, Dan, don't make the mistake of being muted and over to you. I'm, I'm off mute already, I hope. Uh, so if you can look at my, my next slide, please. Yeah, so. I am, I am a network researcher, and, and as a result, when you talk about human-centric networks, uh, I still hear networks, even though the human is increasingly important, obviously. Um, and, and the interesting thing about looking at human centricity as we move towards 6G is that you know, the, the approach that's been taken to, to networks up until this point has been human-centric to a certain extent, because humans are the primary users. Um, but that has made us to a certain extent lazy in the way that we've designed networks. So uh, where we are today is that when you try to consider quality of experience for any kind of, um, any kind of network implementation, it's usually addressed as a quality of service issue rather than really taking into account what genuine quality of experience is about. So um, we, we tend to take a, a number of approaches, which is that when service is critical, we, we throw as much bandwidth and try and reduce delay as much as possible without going into any course understanding of whether that's necessary in all cases. So we have this idea that applications are bundled into certain categories um, and they, you know, they, they tend to be around things like video and gaming and real-time person-to-person -person communications, but, but not all of those are necessarily the same. So for example, in gaming, you have some games which are highly interactive and, and need to be real-time, um, and we're all familiar, I hope, with, uh, with Fortnite and, uh, and PUBG and games like that, where you have hundreds of users all playing at the same time, and, and any delay or any break in service is significantly um, user, user experience impacting. That's not the same if you're playing online chess uh, or Scrabble. Uh, then you can deal with a lot more delay and, and perhaps you won't even perceive it. So that contextualization of quality of experience is something which isn't really pushed down into the network layer at the moment. Uh, and as a result, we have this context-free con sort of context idea of best effort, which often can just say least thought. It means that we, we just do the best that we can within the network, but we don't really address whether we need to do all of that. We just do what we feel is the right thing at the time. Where we're getting to with 5G uh, and, and moving on towards 6G is that we can, we can actually see much more granularity and, and it becomes necessary because even though we want to do things which are more human centric, and, and again, Mona and uh, Demetra both talked about um, all of the, the increased levels of uh, human sensory context, which can be implied into, a, into an application. 
Uh, we're actually designing networks which are going to take information from users or endpoints which have perhaps more extreme requirements than, than humans. Um, so, you know, whilst we can see visible light, um, what a, a, an infrared camera or an ultraviolet camera can see and, and how that can be, uh, the fidelity of that can be transmitted is something which will need to be taken into account. So, so what we are consuming as humans uh, and, and even generating as, as humans perhaps isn't the most extreme use case which is going to exist in the network, even though ultimately what we're trying to do is provide greater human context or greater information which can be consumed to, to give greater benefit to, to humanity as a whole. Um, and we have some technologies in place which are, which are looking to do that, setting aside the, the persistent increase in bandwidth and reduction in delay. The, the idea that you can separate out the different application contexts into different levels of quality of experience and slice a network in such a way that you can do fundamentally different things logically uh, and in terms of quality of experience for, for the network as a whole uh, is, is quite important. And then the other major trend, which is, which is you know, generating a lot of interest at the moment, is obviously the application of artificial intelligence. So it, consuming data out of the network and from, from the end user, applying artificial intelligence and optimizing network delivery as a whole. And so when we move on to look at the, the way that network will be implemented, all of these things become important because um, Right now, we have, a, we have a, a real fundamental issue in that the biggest thing which impacts what the human user experience is, is nothing to do with the technology within the network, it's just where the network is. You know, we're, we're at a very early stage of 5G, 5G deployment now, and, and it's following the traditional trend of focusing on, on dense urban conurbations first, because that's the place that generates most revenue. Whereas when you move into something which you're intending to use to uh, expand out the accessibility for, for humanity as a whole is actually the, the, the poorest areas that you want to go to first, but that doesn't necessarily justify the way that networks get built out in the business case of that network as a whole. Um, on the other side of that, a quality of experience that gets guaranteed um, or, or which has to be guaranteed to deliver a specific application is a double-sided sword. So if you're not delivering quality of experience for something which is an absolutely fundamental critical application, the, the people who are paying a network to deliver that generally want to, to, to know who they can sue and, and who's going to take into account their reputational damage. And um, that's part of the issue with the, the risk versus reward relationship which exists in network engineering today and also commercialization. Um, and so, you know, you, you've, you've got to then take into account that you're, you're going to build a lot of intelligence into the network and you're going to be generating a lot of data you're going to have to justify a lot of uh, GPU and CPU and, and memory in the network um, and sometimes the benefits which get re resulted from that are, are relatively small so um, we, we're starting to see internally a degree of artificial intelligence fatigue where uh, AI is the answer to everything uh, and then you ask what the question is and and it isn't always the right answer. In some cases, just doing a little bit more of infrastructure delivers better results than, than trying to optimize what you've got already. So we clearly have a path to go towards a new uh, application, human-centric model, but the route to get there is a combination of things that we already do and new technology, and, and working out the balance between those is probably uh, the fundamental part to making it stack up as a network architect will build and design. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. And finally, it's with pleasure to invite our, our fourth panelist, a new member of academic staff at the university and actually bringing in his research experience in um, AI. So Exafon, over to you um, for your brief view on the topic. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thank you, Mark. My name is Xenophon Vasilakos, I'm a lecturer at the University of Bristol. Um, I'm happy actually to be the last one to speak because what I wanted to discuss today uh, blends well with uh, everything that uh, the best of the speakers have said so far. Uh, if we can proceed with the next slide, please. So it's a very exciting topic. As Mark said, networks have experienced a tremendous uh, series of changes throughout the years. What you see on the right of your screen is well, my attempt to show a typical server farm with a human administrator lying at the heart of it. 
And uh, although it sounds like an oxymoron, uh, in order to achieve human centrism, we actually need to get rid of um, human intervention. Um, and uh, this is uh, something which is due to uh, a series of reasons, but I would like to highlight only a few of them, which are related to my research that uh, is on uh, network automation with machine learning. And we are working closely with Samsung on that part. I really like the example given by Dan earlier on about uh, gaming. So we need uh, modern networks. We need to radically change the way that we manage them, uh, we control them, uh, we orchestrate them in the first place. And the main reason for that is complexity. Uh, networks are programmable, which comes with a lot of advantages. Uh, it makes them more cost efficient. Uh, it makes them uh, far more flexible, but at the same time, you need to holistically manage these big architectures end to end, full stack end to end. And that makes all decisions very complex, very difficult. You need to take decisions timely. Uh, sometimes, or most of the times, I don't know yet, these decisions need to take place uh, in very short uh, time scales, close to millisecond or even sub millisecond decisions. Obviously, you cannot rely on humans for that. And you can also not rely on humans writing uh, policy rules that apply uh, in every case, okay? Uh, so apart from the complexity and the difficulty of the problems, um, we are also experiencing these days in 5G uh, and unprecedented operational agility, okay, due to all the technological breakthroughs. And one example is holoportation. Now, this refers, sorry, this maps well to this figure, which I hope you can see, that shows uh, what Microsoft has achieved. And that's actually something that they demonstrated five years ago, uh, which means it's not some, a new idea, holoportation is not a new idea, but it's, of course, not cost efficient. Um, this is a good example of uh, a series of services that we will be using in the future uh, with an extreme range of requirements. Uh, seemingly infinite resource capacity is one of them. And I'm saying seeming, seemingly uh, infinite because our experience shows that the more resources you give to the users, the more the demand would be. And there will always not be enough uh, amount of resources to cover the needs. So you need to somehow give the illusion that you've got infinite resources same way that you give the illusion to processes in your computer that they got enough memory available. Um, then latency is one important thing. All the other speakers have more or less touched this topic. Um, uh, that, and at the same time, ultra, lie, uh, ultra high reliability. So if you combine all these three together, and you also consider the fact that we will be needing personalized services to increase customer experience, then this starts to get really, really difficult for humans to handle. Uh, and talking about personalized ser uh, services, obviously they, this is lying at the heart of human centrism. Um, you also want to make these services globally reachable. So if there is a service which is designed especially for me, or if it is a service that it's customizable and I have customized it for me, if I leave the UK and go to Australia, and in the future, if I wanna to go to the Sahara Desert, I should be experiencing exactly the same thing. Uh, now, uh, the last thing is machine-to-machine -machine communication. Dimitra referred to that. As she said, we expect that the number of uh, devices in the future will be 59 times uh, the number of people and maybe even more, who knows? Uh, so combining all this, together, uh, we get a picture about human centrism. All the services will be concentrated on humans and automation is the key to offer that. In order to get the most out of the networks and offer human centrism, uh, we are looking into machine learning based solutions. Uh, ideally, what we would like is for us humans to set the high level policies and rules, and then let the network based on machine learning to do things on its own. This means that if you take a look at the last bullet over there, that the network with the help of machine learning uh, models should become self everything, self-configurable, able to monitor itself, 
able to heal itself and to optimize itself. And uh, of course, as we're going to discuss now, maybe machine learning will be the key to that, maybe will not prove to be the key to that, but this is what we're looking on uh, along with Samsung here in the uh, uh, Smart Internet Lab. And with that, I would like to conclude my uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Thank you. Uh, Right, so if we can pop the slides out of the way. So we will, um, out to the, the delegates at the conference, we will keep an eye on the, um, the questions coming to the, into the Q&A um, section. Uh, I've seen some have been answered, but I will refer back to that in a while. But if I can turn to our, our panelists and ask you in no more than five words, so that's a bit challenging. No. What are the key benefits to society? This has been very much driven at the moment just from technology and the, the, the wow factor. So, Demetra, can, can I come to you first? Your views on a quick view on the benefits to society. Uh, five words. I don't speak with five words. <laughs> <laughs> and here, here has expired already. Uh, let me see. Uh, Benefits to the society, sustainability is the one. So contributing towards net zero targets, and I'm not talking about energy efficiency necessarily. Inclusion and actually, um, you know, just addressing the digital divide. That has been a big issue which suddenly came up front during the pandemic. And when I'm thinking about social targets, is not only addressing problems, it's also actually building the opportunity. So what is the opportunity for social innovation through digital infrastructure? And I'm going to stop here. Okay, so I probably will come back to some of those a little bit later on. So Mona, in, in brief, what do you feel the benefits to society are? Right, uh, perhaps with reference uh, on what Dimitri already mentioned on the inclusion part, um, this societal benefit perhaps would be that uh, people or human services are treated more on personalized level according to their capabilities, needs, and uh, their um, potential impairments. So this is something that has not been addressed in previous uh, uh, technologies and the human centric approach would allow that capability to be addressed much more than five words. Yeah. <laughs> so Dan, building on what's already been said, have you, have you thought of any other benefits to society? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I actually, there are some of the ones that have been already said, which I, I think are noble but unachievable. Um, so I, I've gone for things which are perhaps more traditional, but safety, security, greater connectivity and inclusivity. But when I talk about inclusivity, what I'm talking about is, is perhaps greater accessibility across the socioeconomic divide rather than inclusivity in the, in the, the way we're describing more. OK, thanks. We'll probably come back to sort of the EDI yeah. issues a, a bit later on. Exophon, is there anything you would like to, to add? So what can I say after everyone else having said everything, uh, I will be very brief. Uh, I think you can summarize everything in advancing the society. By every okay. means. Right, thank you. Right, so we, we noticed that machine learning um, popped up several times and seen, it seems to be the solution to all our, our, our problems. But drilling into that in probably more depth, what really are the key technology enablers to Realize, realize the vision that you've all um, laid out and do we have the skill base in the UK to deliver this or certainly make major contributions to and Exafon, could I start with you? <laughs> okay, so that is actually a very good question. Um, machine learning is not a new concept. It's been around for decades. Uh, it's a specific uh, uh, it falls under artificial intelligence, of course. Uh, in the past, people were expecting, especially in the 80s, that by now everything will be automated and based on uh, artificial intelligence. But that didn't prove to be, that was too good to be true. And that was because of the technology to blame back at the time. Since 
the past 15 years, there have been technological breakthroughs like uh, GPUs and TPUs by Google that have allowed us actually to have the appropriate hardware to uh, use machine learning. So returning back to your question, is machine learning guaranteed um, to be the key uh, for human centrism and uh, for uh, 6G networks in the future? Well, I don't have an answer to that yet, but definitely it's worth investigating. There are known limitations. Some of them have been touched by our speakers. I remember Dan talking about uh, um, interpret in, uh, sorry, interpretability. Okay, if you can interpret the results, who to blame, blameability. Uh, if you're dealing with a self-driving car and because of AI you hit somebody, is it you to blame? Is it uh, the, the machine learning algorithm? Same questions exist also for networks. I mean, if something goes wrong, um, who do you sue? The algorithm, uh, the creator of the algorithm, the one that bought the algorithm, there's no human administrator, okay? Um, then you also have some problems which are deterministic and easy to solve. Uh, so machine learning, although it can solve virtually everything, you don't need to always apply machine learning. And the last point regards data, which again, all of our speakers more or less talked about, uh, you may be lacking the data for various reasons, because they don't exist or because it's too expensive to get them or because there are privacy restrictions. You may be having data, but they might be not of good uh, quality. And um, what else can you say? Um, yeah, overall, it's a big bet, but it's worth investigating. That's what I would say. And talking about the UK, definitely yes. Right now we are amongst the pioneers. Okay, believe. good. Dan, you know, you, you sort of hinted we shouldn't throw machine learning at everything. <laughs> um, do you want to add to anything that um, Exapon has, has mentioned? But yeah, I, and, and it kind of comes back to that point. So I think, I think certainly um, AI and ML are, are an important tool to have in the toolbox. and. There are places where uh, the application of artificial intelligence into networks and, and applications uh, is already delivering results. The, the challenge of trying to um, apply artificial intelligence to optimize the entire network, uh, and particularly optimizing the entire network where your requirements are things which we're, we're still working out now, um, is that the, 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 the quantity of data is so huge. So you know, we, we can perhaps be optimistic about how Moore's law allows us to continue to improve performance of the network and the compute functions that sit underneath it and would support AI and ML um, to provide that optimization. But accessibility to data and in volume of data and manipulation of data are, are huge challenges in their own right. Um, and that, that's the part which drives this economic issue where um, the answer to every question on AI applied to network seems to be around about 10%. Um, you can get 10% improvement on, on lots of different things, but I don't necessarily believe that that equates to um, an exponential multiplier of lots of 10% one after another, because what you find is that different AIs compete for, for optimizations and, and you end up roughly where you are to start with. So as a very brief example, we did some work looking at um, optimizing base stations to to turn them off during quiet hours to, during the night and, and had an AI algorithm which would help you move end users off of one particular rat so that you could shut it down. And at the same time, another team in Canada was building a, an AI application to do load balancing and was pushing subscribers back onto the rats. <laughs> and, and so, so until you've got those two things ticked together and optimizing against each other, you're not really optimizing anything. You're causing yourself a bigger problem. So, you take that, that microcosmic issue and expand it across an end to end network solution. And there's a huge amount of complexity there which needs to be worked out. So, um, and, and when you're working it out, you'll find that some things are great and some things aren't, and some things are destructive of others. Um, and the cost overall just continues to rise and rise. And that's cost fiscally, but also in terms of uh, everything we're trying to do around, uh, around a zero carbon uh, economy as well. Well, thank you for that. Um, well, real world example that you you brought in, and maybe we're well. I was going to talk more about uh, machine and humans, but machines fighting machines seems to be a bit of a theme there. So, that sounds far too apocalyptic. 
<laughs> Mon Mona and Demetra, do, do you wish to add anything about machine learning and its uh, appropriateness for, for the problem? Not machine learning for me, but your question was not about machine learning. I think we address this extensively. Your question was about technologies, key the technologies, enablers. correct? Yeah. And enablers. So what I hear from everybody, I hear about customization of services to some degree or the other. Yes, where the customization reads is a different, I think that we have a very, a little bit different perspective, but customization means agility. Uh, and that means security. So security, it's very important, either cy cyber or quantum to secure our infrastructure, secure services, secure devices. So that's the one. Uh, we talked about co-creation and co-creation actually assumes open infrastructures, at, at the very least open interfaces, open APIs. So the whole move towards open networking and the technologies involved, they are also very important. Then Mona and myself, we talked about Internet of Senses and sensory information. Everybody talked about holograms. Uh, that implies a lot of bandwidth being transmitted at very low latency. And that to me means that we really need to innovate deep in the, into the network infrastructure once again to be able to support these kind of applications. So we need a lot of new enablers in addition to AI machine learning, because we need to deliver that agility customization, but also the usual things like bandwidth and everything else. Okay, thank you. Mona, do you wish to thank add you. anything at this time? I think our colleagues have covered covered all technology aspects and the KPIs. One uh, uh, point that I actually wanted to add to this, and particularly <coughs> because your question addressed UK uh, um, uh, of the skills, skills. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the base uh, as a uh, location um, is actually related to machine learning. The <coughs> ethics behind using um, the tools uh, and also some policy making which is down to actually government it's, it's, it, it differs from a government to other one we have got examples uh, maybe just an example that we currently all involved with NHS tracing and the use of data that can be facilitated by the uh, communication technology that we have in place but we touch the sense and the whole uh, uh, discussion uh, between uh, in, uh, society, whether it's something needed, how it should be handled, what standards and uh, the, um, uh, consideration needs to be in place. So um, another point that I actually wanted to just add on the technology and the, uh, the, the vision for human-centric approach is the role of um, governments or policymakers to look at uh, in, in parallel with the technology uh, progress to address the society needs, even it can be supported through the standardization one. Um, we have a GDPR data protection, for instance, for Europe, which also we are compliant to. If you are looking further on human-centric communication, uh, further uh, some more sensitive data collections needs to be uh, considered, as well as the tools to support potential adversarial attacks. For instance, we are looking at machine uh, learning to automate everything. So uh, it is a new uh, matrix threat that we need to address in parallel with the uh, government and the policymakers in this sense. Okay, thank you. Right, there's been some quite interesting questions coming into the, um, the chat, into the chat, especially from Ken Moore with mobile. Um, which was to do with behaviour science and if the standardisation bodies are actually taking this into account, which Mona has very kindly answered. Dan, I don't know if, if, if you've had any experience to see the way sort of the, the, the human factors are really being um, considered in the work that you see in the standardisation processes at Samson? Yeah, it's... It is, it's certainly a challenging aspect to try and bring in because um, you know, traditionally standardization has been about making the networks work and, and it, it, it moves away from anything which is, I'm not gonna say necessarily relevant to the human, but certainly anything which is, which is relevant to um, 
the, the purpose that networks are put to. So it, there's always been a, an understanding that certain applications have, have certain sets of requirements, but it's, it's classified in terms of whether it's a data uh, or a you know, traditional terms, a circuit switch network or a messaging. Um, and then what people do on top of that, to a certain extent, is their business. Now, I, I'm not trying to suggest that we, we should turn human centricity into, um, into something which requires a business case necessarily, but it will get to the point where how far down a, a human centric line you go has to be justifiable as a business as a whole. Uh, and as a result, it, it's kind of slightly parked outside of standardization in that you know, there are certain things you could do within standards to, to move in the right direction for that, but whether they're implemented or not, it, it comes down to each individual operator to determine. Uh, and so when I, you know, I read the question, I also read my owner's answer with regard to uh, some of the places where, where work has started on this. You know, of the three, um, four that, that Mona has identified, um, 3GPP, IEEE and, and NGMN, NGMN is the one which probably has um, has it closest to being within scope. And it's more of that kind of uh, operator community field where you can start to generate a, a consensus view on what the industry as a whole should do. Um, and the irony, of course, with all of this is that, that myself and Ken both formally work for the GSMA and, and the GSMA isn't on the list of places which Mona has mentioned, but in times past, probably we would have been the place where things like that happen. And there is an awful lot of work done within GSMA now towards uh, the United Nations SDGs. Um, how that reflects into to what their future direction will be around human centricity, I think, is something which we have to wait and see. Yeah. So, Dimitri, I was just thinking back to um, you know, the 5G showcases that have uh, been in Bristol um, and, and, and in Bath with the 5G tourism. Um, do you feel we, we captured the sort of the the human in the loop and um, the the requirements of the, the humans quite quite well in the way we design that those, those experiments and those those demonstrations. I think we just scratched the surface. We had enthusiastic audiences, yeah. but really, uh, so my answer to your question is no. If we would like really to incorporate human and address human centricity we need to methodologically to innovate on methodology on how we are we need to do this and at the moment i mean dan you spoke about uh, uh, quality of experience this is one way of measuring things for me is a very dry way of measuring things uh, is we have to actually start incorporating perception you know, and also do do some analysis in terms of explainability. What does this mean? There is so much work. I'm going to mention AI again, but please forgive me. For instance, there's so much work on explainable AI, for instance, that is addressing consumer sectors, uh, insurance sectors, and so on, more on the retail side of things, where actually they have done a lot of work to understand, you know, human needs or analyze human needs. And we never actually methodologically as community went to an approach like this to actually do an analysis on the human side, incorporate it within our system design. And this is a methodological take. So it has nothing to do getting users ex exciting because of a music event it has actually to do quite a lot you know a learning curve analyzing data analyzing experiences analyzing culture you know and diversity in order to be able actually to methodologically include humans in the loop of our design and i don't know anybody that has done this really very much um okay Thank you. Well, um, panelists, also keep an eye of what's going on in the, the questions, um, especially the one from Lena at uh, Chalmers University. If anybody's brave enough to draw a roadmap out while we're talking and wants to show it at the end, that would be quite interesting. Um, what I'd like to turn now is move into EDI, um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And what we've, we've all talked about is, you know, quite a a complex mix of, of technology, 
requiring um, high bandwidth and low latency. So will this be the playground just to the wealthy going forward? So sorry to put you on the spot, Dimitri. Would you like to comment on that? Again, um, I think, would that be the spot for the wealthy? Um, we are thinking actually on how network services are offered at the moment. I think when we are looking for instance, these issues around inclusion and digital divide, we have to look at alternative business models. I don't think it's a technology problem. I think it's a business model, how we provide connectivity and to whom, and how we open that this opportunity for digital equity. And, and I think this, these are important issues and there are different models around, for instance, alternative operator pricing, smart contracts, but also, uh, models that are based on locality, for instance, municipal service provisioning. Uh, I'm not actually the expert to do that, but we are doing through the, the, the Bristol Digital Futures Institute, we are doing some work with colleagues that they are specialists on inclusive economy. And uh, this work has just started and is working with uh, communities directly to see where the problem of digital equity lies. Uh, during the pandemic, we have done a questionnaire in different parts of Bristol in order to collect data to understand where, what is the source of the divide. We got back six and a half thousand questionnaires and we are analyzing this data, not me, social scientists within the university, digital social scientists, they are anal analyzing the data. But one of the big barriers that we have seen that is coming already is not so much pricing or skills, it's actually provision of digital infrastructure to the level that actually, you know, is not a barrier to this divide. This is becoming a paper, it's going to be published. And then there is this inclusive economy expertise that we have within Bristol that they are going to address the issue about the new business models for digital equity offering. I know I'm not answering, but I'm just telling you that there's some thinking going on in these topics. Okay, thank you. We don't have a network operator um, on, the, on, the, on the panel to, uh, to challenge them on this. So I, we're gonna have to turn to um, our industrial um, panelists. So to Mona, is there anything um, that, do you, do you feel we're gonna create a further social divide just for the wealthy or will this be for all? Right, um, I think this is an interesting uh, angle that you have um, suggested in, in this question. Um, to the contrary, perhaps when at least uh, the, the time I was uh, um, busy as part of uh, British Telecom as an operator, and uh, maybe I can um, share perspective, um, uh, well, as a ex-operator uh, uh, employee, um, the, the view uh, was actually to see that as a service uh, enabler and advancement, as uh, Exapa mentioned, for uh, the technology to advance the uh, personalized services um, uh, and per perhaps to include different uh, pr profiles of the users. Uh, one example that um, we were looking at a time uh, as part of the uh, British Telecom was to find out how the services either on the network side as well as the um, uh, user side can actually address the user impairment with a particular example of association with uh, uh, people with visual impairment uh, and how perhaps tactile internet can support navigation of these categories. So that's a huge technology advancement to include users need uh, and user profile that have not cu currently been uh, looked after or considered as part of the services that are provided by service providers. So um, as Dimitri rightly said, it's down to how the business model is going to be uh, set up, but um, there might be um, business opportunities, uh, either for operators or micro operators uh, and vendors to provide that uh, and utilize it. But overall, um, I think the, the capabilities there are more to address and uh, improve the inclusion of the service for 
different categories and capabilities. Okay, thank you. So with a, a view on, on time at the moment, I'd really like to turn to the, the problem that, you know, machine learning and the, some of the technologies required in this um, is going to require quite a high compute. Demetra mentioned there could, you know, we'd like to have 59 times more devices on the planet than the number of people. So this then starts to question the net zero agenda, both in terms of energy and precious materials, and is it sustainable? So, Dan, is this going towards net zero or is this um, deviation? <laughs> well, so, so I think we I think we have a fundamental problem as an industry as a whole uh, in terms of achieving net zero. In that we, we're very good at turning new networks on and not very good at turning old networks off. So to, to get to net zero, you know, we, we're in a situation where um, what we're actually doing is, is putting more and more layers on top of things that already exist that aren't net zero in their own right. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're trying to take on um, a part of a challenge, which is a, a global issue, uh, much bigger than just mobile networks and mobile operators. So I think the best thing we can do is, is try our best to, to do our part and hope that everybody else pulls their weight. And across this whole discussion, one of the things that I've noted um, is that you know, we, we're talking um, about human-centric network, but then we're talking about an awful lot of social issues which exist for a whole bunch of reasons other than networking. So you know, across the board, net zero, inclusivity, uh, education for the, for the poorly educated, all of that we can enable um, to a certain extent within the, the capabilities of networks, but it isn't just in our hands. For the industry to become net zero, we can go a certain distance, but it, it requires an awful lot of other things in terms of, like you say, the extraction of precious metals to become net zero with us. Um, and that's, that's you know, ecosystems outside of ours. Can we get there? Um, yes, I think we can. Uh, the question more broadly and outside of the, the four people and the moderator on this panel and the people asking the questions is uh, how do we motivate the will to do that? And that I think is something which is a, a much more fundamental societal question. Well, we're at the hour and great George is struck in Bristol. I don't know if you heard it, those of you who are on, online connected too. So just before um, I, I close the questions off, does, do any other panelists wish to comment any further on the net zero part? Okay, well, thank you, Dan, for that. Um, so I need to bring the session to a close. So a big thank you to our, our panelists, um, the delegates online, and for those who popped some questions in. It's really great to, to see those, and I tried to weave them in as much as I could. And also for our backroom team that really made this, this, this happen today. So could I encourage you to join the Remo um, networking session, which uh, the details were in the, the invitation. And also we'd really appreciate if you could fill in the, the, the survey, um, the questionnaire about the conference so we can see how things are um, coming, to, coming together. So thank you all very much. Uh, been a most exciting session. So thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.